yeah, basically everyone sort of like has, has heard about regulation uh, in the US, in Europe, uh, in the rest of the world, uh, because essentially this is uh, outside our community, in the policy community, in the political community, uh, this is something which is uh, yeah, simply happening uh, globally. Um, although, since we're in Europe, I'm going to focus a little bit on Europe. Uh, the second reason to focus a little bit on Europe is because Europe is slightly ahead of all the others. Although I'm, I'm expecting that quite soon the US and others will probably overtake Europe because, uh, as you know, our elections are going to be long and, and slow. But before I dive into sort of like this regulation in the, the Cyber Resilience Act, just a few words of like about our industry, about that amazing growth we've seen, about the fact that everything is becoming software that basically sort of like the thing that sort of like has driven the fact that that software is is now so important in society that it's absolutely everywhere um, because that very thing is very highly tied to why XT people talk about regulation because if that wouldn't be the case there wouldn't be a talk about regulation at all and in sort of like in many ways sort of like if you think sort of like what defines our industry what makes that we sort of like uh, uh, really sort of like innovate that we take over entire sectors that our software creeps absolutely everywhere that's almost if sort of like if it's bursting to grow then in many ways you could sort of like argue sort of like that that what defines our industry is sort of like this this this, this, this slogan here from from uh, Zuckerberg sort of like from Facebook uh, until sort of like the uh, the the sort of 2010 or so is move fast and break things and if you're not breaking things you're not moving fast enough that's really sort of like uh, yeah sort of like the core of a lot of the, the reasons why things innovate so fast. Now, believe it or not, Mark was not exactly the first person who sort of like used this, this move fast and break things. In fact, if you look back in technology history and engineering history, this has actually happened many, many, many times over when the conditions were right, uh, when there was enough money in the market for certain things and risk could be taken. I'm just going to sort of like pick a random one from, from the past, from the sort of like mid-1800s. There was this wonderful thing, steam boilers, steam engines. And if you had one of those, you could really sort of like make a profit. You could certainly sort of like run factories and not, having, sort of not, not be limited by human and animal power. But actually, you could, run and you could run this at high speed and really sort of like make a lot of money. So you could sort of like really move fast. And yeah, occasionally these things sort of like did explode uh, in, in big boiler explosions. And that very fact of like is, is so like f quite fundamental to this issue that you somehow find yourself in a market where if you are uh, taking a very high risk, uh, um, that risk is rewarded and that market is very cash risk. There are like a lot of returns on that and there are basically no limits of where you can grow. If you sort of like can build more factories, you can build more stuff, sell more stuff. So that basically means larger risk, larger payouts. And ultimately, because you're sort of like taking more and more risk, the payouts are getting larger and larger and larger. By definition, the kabooms are also going to be a bit sort of like uh, uh, larger, of course. Um, and of course, sort of like at some point, someone still had the brilliant idea of putting these steam engines sort of like onto, onto wheels and starting carting them around to the country. And of course, these things exploded as well. I actually found that there's a whole genre of actually uh, carts of, of horrible explosions and how horrible they were in, in, uh, from that era. Um, and of course, that goes on and on and on until the rulers of that time, of that particular era, I'm now picking on the steam era, but I can pick any technological sort of like jump era. Um, they sense that, that it's enough, uh, the citizens have had enough, or they themselves have had enough, or it's affecting their bottom line, it's bad for society, their own businesses, their profits, their taxes, whatever else, and they sort of like tell the industry like, Sorry, guys, you've got to sort this out. You've got to regulate yourself. Stop blowing our cities up. Stop sort of like killing our citizens and everything else. Just stop it. And invariably, nothing then happens. Because every individual sort of like engaged in this still sort of like when they take a risk, they always believe their steam boiler won't explode. And if a few of them explode, they'll probably survive. Uh, and basically, the rewards are just too big. So there's a fundamental reason when you're in that sort of like space, when there is a, a possibility sort of like jump up with an industry, uh, when in, basically when there is a lot of cash returns, that you're simply sort of like, it's not just going to happen. There are just too many people who kind of like are too greedy or too eager. The, the rewards are too large. And yeah, basically a few things sort of like uh, blowing up is sort of like acceptable business practice. Or a few people may go bust even. But it's certainly not the case that, that yeah, the other, other people having steam engines will sort of like jump in and compensate uh, for the damages. So ultimately, this happens everywhere. After like one very, very large explosion, uh, yeah, uh, basically things come to an end in a, in a more harsh way. Um, I'm taking the example here from the US. This is the Boston Shoe Factory, or rather what remains of the Boston Shoe Factory and the, the village around it. Um, uh, basically, uh, um, enough is enough. Uh, and you can find exactly the same pictures for the UK, for the Netherlands, for Germany. There is basically one explosion, too many, and that's the end. Now, what's interesting that in almost all of those cases, 
industry failed to regulate. They did not come together. And after the Boston Shoe Factory, the same thing. Basically, the industry had, had had a chance for about 20 years to regulate itself. It did not do it. What happened here? A group of engineers from competing companies came together and sat down and made, in a very short period of time, made what's known as the boiler and pressure code, which actually exists to this day. They actually wrote down the rules. How do you operate a steam engine safely? Um, and ultimately, that became the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and they exist today. That is a society very much like ours. It's a bunch of engineers who together determine what their safety standards are. Uh, and even though they work for competing companies, they collaborate on, on that particular piece. Um, now, if we look at sort of like our industry, <laughs> we sort of like now have gotten to that level, right? <laughs> and this is what people see, basically. They see a big explosion. They see the aftermath. Of course, we think that when we're dealing with something like the, the, the recent XZ example or, or Log4J, we see ourselves working hard fixing the place. They see us basically wandering around in the ruins of an explosion we've caused ourselves. <laughs> right. And there's a second thing happening here. Um, and this also happens in all of those individual cycles, is that the cost of all of these damages are not really borne by the person who reaps the wealth of when it goes well. Uh, generally, sort of like the manufacturer may go bust, and uh, society sort of like has to pay with human lives and, and damages and everything else. Certainly, sort of like the other manufacturer is not going to yeah, pay for that or anything else like that. And that happens sort of like time and time again. If you sort of like skip forward a little bit, basically, this is like a, a picture from 1971 about sort of like chemical factories. There was suddenly this wonderful stuff called plastics and nylons. Um, and um, yeah, they were really, really, really great. Uh, but the pollution, yeah, well, that was dumped down the river and, and for society. And even in 1971, they're worried about the penguins on, on Antarctica. So essentially, sort of like we have sort of like here, uh, not only do people take risk, but the, the rewards are for them, the damages are for society. So that's common basically on every industry. So that just hits a point where it's important, basically, that we humans kind of like do not want these things to fail. And in fact, at some point, if your industry is important enough, you cross a threshold when we actually say something else. We say it's more important to us humans to not have it fail than the innovation and wealth it would bring when we leave it unchecked. So essentially, the politicians, the policymaker, the public is making an engineering trade-off. And they're accepting that certain things have to go a bit slower or certain wealth sort of like has to be reduced a bit because killing humans is just not sort of like, yeah, important enough uh, for, for sort of like to offset all the other benefits you're, you're having. And it's very important to understand that this concept now for software, for our industry, is uh, completely and totally and utterly agreed among politicians, policymakers, lawmakers, basically everyone. There is no controversy, there is no discussion, this is completely agreed. And in the run-up to the Cyber Resilience Act and the other acts, there has been very extensive global traveling between Europe, the US, uh, South America, Asia, and so on, where all those government and big power blocks have completely coordinated on this. There is basically, uh, this is basically generally universally agreed. And counter pressure, lobbying from our industry has generally been counterproductive. It generally sort of like, confirmed to everyone involved, yes, we're on the right path, we're apparently hitting them where it hurts, they're going to basically change behavior, this is effective. And any moaning about the cost that this regulation will have on innovation, and I'll talk about that later, it will have very significant cost on innovation and things like that, um, are basically useless. The business case is overwhelmingly positive. If you basically uh, uh, yeah, lose a few tens or hundreds of billions of dollars a year, on the value of innovation, things like that. But you save literally many trillions that same year uh, based on the damages to society. The business case, yeah, basically for us as a whole is positive. Right. So if we sort of like take that sort of like, let's look at sort of like now specifically what those regulations are which are being brought in. And I'm basically going to focus at Europe at the expense of the other parts of the world, but essentially they're roughly all the same. Uh, and actually quite the same actually because of international trade relations. So the first one, basically, we need to talk about is the Product Liability Directive. And it's, it's the rules and regulations, and they're actually quite old, which covers absolutely everything in this room. The chair you're sitting on, the speaker here, this microphone, a glass of water, um, uh, the, the lemonade, and so on. And it basically sort of like makes sure that 
you never have to worry about when you sit down on a normal chair in a hotel like this, you never sort of like have to check whether the chair is, is, is good enough or when you buy basically a piece of bread, you don't have to engage your own laboratory to check whether the bread is healthy. No, it basically makes sure that, that products you're using are generally sound and safe and they cover everything. In fact, they even cover software, but we kind of like have forgotten about. And this liability directive, it largely and mainly applies to humans. So it is a, it's, all, it's concerned about the, the harm you're doing to a natural person. And typically, historically, that harm was losing an arm, losing an eye, getting sick, uh, that sort of stuff. Um, although it does contain things about emotional harm. So for example, when you lose your uh, family heirloom, your family photos in a big fire, let's say in a storage facility, um, it recognizes that the damage of that is higher than, let's say, if, if some paper of yours was, was sort of like went up in flames. So actually, the, uh, whoever runs that facility has to actually is held to a higher standard than, let's say, if they were just like storing paper. So it does actually recognize that. Uh, and this is also where that voiding of warranties and uh, uh, basically all these other things sort of like and, 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 and all our disclaimers uh, comes from. Because the PLD is crystal clear. When you deliver this to a consumer, you can't deliver a chair and says like, well, yeah, well, you get a chair as is, and uh, yeah, if it breaks, you get to keep the pieces. No, I mean, basically, that chair, if you sell it like a chair, it's going to be safe, uh, no matter what. Right. So, um, uh, what it actually sort of like says in general, that, that PLD, if you read it, it's really, really simple. Be sound, be responsible, uh, basically make sure it's fit for the sort of like normal expected use. So if you've got a hammer, the head shouldn't fly off. Uh, but if, if someone, for example, abuses a hammer completely and uses it the wrong way, then it's fine if it breaks. Liability just, just, just sort of like doesn't really apply. So it's actually quite a fair deal. If you, if you use things right, um, uh, if you produce things right, you're actually well protected against lawsuits. If you do, basically, if you're a careless producer, all the liabilities of, all, is on you, completely unlimited, and, and you're basically a uh, dead meat. And then on top of that uh, product liability directive, there are a lot of other, like thousands, literally thousands of other uh, more specific regulations which then clarify what is actually uh, uh, being, yeah, basically being responsible. So for example, for toys, it will say like, well, actually, if you use paints, they should be safe paints. It doesn't actually tell that what that is. That's actually another standard, but that's, that's usually what it is. And in some cases, or in actually quite a lot of cases, it will be very practical and specific, that standard. So, for example, in the, in the toy safety one, it says, for example, well, if it's for a small kid, you've got to apply this test whether a kid can choke, which is nothing more than a well-described little sort of like plastic doohickey. And if something fits in there, uh, then the, the kid can choke on it. You can't market it to kids. If you can actually put it in there and take it out again, then actually it is safe for kids. So they're very pragmatic and very, very simple. And absolutely everyone in those industries, and I really mean everyone, is laboring under this, understands this, and will actually have that test tube sort of like sitting somewhere in their factory. So um, this is sort of like not something new, this is something extremely well understood uh, in the entire industry. Now, in um, sort of like our world, um, uh, so the, basically the same thing happened there. So first of all, the product liability directive is modified in two places. Software and services and these other things are simply added to the list, like somewhere below silverware. So basically, we're just now on the list of, yeah, of products. And by the way, products is a really bad term because actually products also include things like, I don't know, uh, sil uh, like uh, uh, certain services, uh, energy, and so on. So products take that, they take that very, very broadly. Um, and the second little change they made is they made clear that um, digital goods, digital data, like your family photos, are just as important as like paper, for, uh, paper photos. So um, if you are harmed uh, because you've uh, uh, basically, or you've got emotional distress because of the loss of data, uh, of digital data, that's just basically the same as if you were emotionally harmed because you lost your family hair loan. Or if you're uh, basically, uh, an algorithm takes a bad decision or a slow decision and you're harmed by that, uh, that's the same as basically it was like a normal decision in sort of like a, let's say some, some progress ran, uh, pro, um, uh, uh, protocol ran by humans. So basically, sort of like they clarify essentially things a little bit. Then the second so the thing which comes in is Cyber Resilience Act, which I'll go in more detail in a minute. But basically, that one says, thou shall do good security. That's really all it really says. I mean, ba basically be sound about, about uh, uh, software security. And then there's a whole bunch of very specific ones, which then are for very specific industries like NIST2, Dora, AI Act, uh, DSA, Interop Act, and so on. And for example, uh, Dora is for finance. Dora sort of like 
then clarifies what do you mean with good security, central security. Well, it says actually thou shall do a pen one turn pen test a year of, of decent quality and uh, um, at least one pen test for every big release. And you shall basically follow the OVASP standards. So basically it's sort of like then becomes more specific. And as those standards go down and down, they get more and more specific. But they're also highly uh, yeah, uh, narrow basically for whatever field you're working in. So they're basically fit for that field. Um, the Cyber Resilience Act doesn't apply to everything. There are a couple of fields like aviation, medicals, cars, and so on, which get their own, uh, basically, uh, regulation. So basically, whatever is in that regulation overrides the CRA. So if you're in, in those specific fields, like marine, uh, you get basically your own version of that. Um, now, the political work on all of this uh, is, is essentially done now. Um, uh, the only one which isn't really done is the AI Act, but that's because no one really understands AI and what that means. Uh, but all the other ones, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're done. Uh, they're, they're, they're written. Um, uh, some of them are waiting for publication in the official journals. Some of them are waiting for national parliaments to sort of like give the final rubber stamps. Uh, but that's basically a matter of, of, of days and weeks now, essentially, for, for all of that. Um, and essentially, they also have like become effective, or, or like DORA have already become effective uh, earlier, but they also have like become effective in a sort of like stage process, uh, um, yeah, sort of like in the next sort of like three years. And every year, sort of like more of, the step, a bit more of the law basically becomes applicable. So really, it is already sort of like there. Now you know what it is, but basically sort of like there's, there's a grace time as they sort of like roll it in. Right. So... For us, as the ASF, we do general software. We don't really know who our users are. So for us, the Cyber Resilient Act, Act and also the, the other equivalents in the world, that's basically it. That's where it is. That, that's, that's the one that matters. Because as soon as you're more specific, it actually gets quite e actually easier because you know exactly what to do. It's the Cyber Resilience Act, the generic one which matters. Right. Now, um, if you sort of like <laughs> have already sort of glazed over on all this boring detail, Basically, if, if the only thing you want to remember about the Cyber Resilience Act, it basically is sort of like, do decent security. Doing decent security is now the law, is the rule, is the regulation. And that means proper testing, proper triage when you get a bug, when you get a bug reported or vulnerability reported, proper fixing, proper updates for your end users, um, and uh, proper disclosure of the issues you're having. And all of that is risk-based. So if something is very, very severe, do it quickly. If something is very mundane, you may not need to do it at all. So none of this is bypassable easily, or you can't find loopholes. Like I have a, I have a form where, where people can just fill out the issues with vulnerabilities, but I never read what, it, what it's being said there, or I just ignore the issues. No, basically, it, it is about outcomes here, uh, basically, uh, around these things. And the other thing you have to take away from all of this, and this is actually echoing what David is saying, um, these, all these acts, rules, and regulations put the natural, the human first. So they're actually not so much about B2B, but they're only about the bit where you hit a normal human. And of course, the entire chain above it. So effectively, it means anything anyway. But it is basically, so whenever you're considering, whenever you're making an engineering trade-off, whenever you're making a product decision, whenever you're making a company decision, you've got to consider the citizen. You've got to consider your end user. And their needs are not negotiable so you can't say it's too expensive or it's too hard or whatever else no if it is you're basically having a product that's illegal that you can't place on the market so if you're in, in sort of like a business model where actually yeah security doing security is simply too expensive for that product then that product has to disappear from the market so it's just like if you're selling selling chairs which after a year would basically sort of like a break yeah well sorry you're not allowed to place that on the market i mean it, there may be great business to be made out of that but that, that's just the way that is so essentially what it says basically be responsible adults here when it comes to security and it, it really sort of like to a large extent is is that simple now you may recall that sort of like about like two years ago this whole cra was was a complete disaster in how it was written uh, because it said that uh, yeah basically uh, anyone everyone was always liable and 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 so on and it basically it essentially made open source completely impossible uh, which was actually uh, yeah rather uh, rather true and rather unfortunate 
Um, what happened since was that thanks to uh, basically experts at the European Commission, um, in, in the US uh, government, um, uh, in the open source community, uh, where we sort of like came together to help explain this, but also basically people, for example, in the German automotive industries, uh, companies like Bosch, for example, they were absolutely instrumental to explaining uh, basically to the powers that be that actually open source software is absolutely everywhere. It's 90% of the sort of like software stack. And that if you killed that, um, that was probably not a very good idea. Um, so they listened to their credit and last minute they created uh, a solution. They created a totally new economic actor, a totally new concept, just like you have concept like for example industry or public sector. They've now created an extra one which is called open source steward. And that's actually a very, very rare thing because only four of those legal concepts sort of like at that level around and we are sort of like number four in that list. So basically it's recognized that there is, a, there is something else than industry and public sector and so on. There's actually, uh, there are actually people who are stewards of an open body of data that benefits society. And that's exactly sort of like that almost maps one-to-one -to, -one to the definition David gave you of the Apache Software Foundation that we do software pu for public good. So in return for doing for public software for public good, we get a very special status under the CRA. Uh, it still basically sort of like means that we still have to sort of like do, do sort of like uh, um, uh, decent security, but basically that's what was introduced uh, in there. And the other things which stayed the same, uh, all your uh, waivers and disclaimers are out of the door. You've now got what's in the US called strict liability, so you're totally liable. You can't cap it. Uh, it's also for secondary and tertiary damages, so basically just get over that. That's just the reality of it. You're basically now, as an industry, we're now the same as the bloke who sends, uh, basically who sells a chair or, or a glass or anything else. Um, so the impact of the CRA is first and foremost on our industry as a whole. It's not so much on us because we as open source stewards got a special role, but it is on the industry and, and nothing of that waivers. It does mean that like certain models will be no longer viable. Um, it will also mean, and this is calculated in, that software will generally get more expensive and think about sort of like 30%. So software and services will basically get about 30% more expensive. And that number is all like based on good economic studies. It's also based on past experience because we've done this before. We've done this with the car industry and all sorts of other industries. We've done it. And what happened there was, yes, everything became more expensive. Yes, there was a lot of roadkill and small companies died. Uh, companies had to basically merge. If you look at the European car industry, there's lots of merging uh, in that in that era of, of the, the cars, of the, the seat belts and things like that. Um, but generally, sort of like the business case was positive for society in, in what we saved. So roadkill road kill is completely calculated in. It's completely sort of like understood that this will kill companies. Um, and there's also a lot of funding available and, and, and really things sort of like in the, in the hundreds of millions a year, in the billions of year, to actually offset the effects of this to help communities like ours build the tools uh, and build the means and have, have basically help the industry help itself to actually sort of like get to this level. Right, so what is that open source steward? Well, it's quite a definition. But it's actually fairly easy to sort of like parse what they're thinking and what we need to do. So it means a legal person, other than a manufacturer, so they're really recognizing that manufacturers or people who sort of like make products are not the same as open source stewards. Of course, if we as an open source steward start to actually basically put things on the market, like start to sell them or things like that, we're instantly no longer an open source steward. So we instantly drop out. But as long as we, we are other than a manufacturer, and we then sort of like have the, the purpose or the objective to systematically provide support, sustained basis for the development. So basically this is not a one-off, you're not doing it for something small, no, it has to be systematic, sustained for the development. So, so it's very, very clear that this is just not a one-off you can do on the side or something you can spin out of your company, no. It basically has to sort of like be for a long period of time and set up for that, for that development. Um, of the systematic products with digital elements, that's actually the legal sort of like uh, word for software. So if whenever you see now uh, uh, something with digital elements, it basically means software uh, because you also want to include firmware and, 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 and FGPAs and things like that. Um, and, when, and then the next requirement is that it needs to be qualifying um, as free and open source software. So it's very, very clear that this open source steward only applies to basically the things which are roughly under the open source definition. Um, and I'll get to that whole definition problem in a bit. Um, so basically it has to be open source software and it's intended for commercial activities. So that's actually quite important. So it means if you're doing a total hobby open source sort of thing, which is not intended for commercial, um, uh, commercial activities, you are, you're not in the open source steward exemption. In, in principle, the full CRA falls to you. There are in the CRA a couple of clauses for real hobbyists and for so-called micro-enterprises, which lighten things up. But in principle, 
if what you're doing is not reasonably intended for commercial activities, you're not an open source steward. So this is this is important for some academic projects and, and hobby projects, but but not for the ASF. I mean, we're clearly in that that field. Um, and then the final thing is, it's crucial that you're ensuring the viability of those products. And what that really means is that you must show that you're uh, making that product viable. So your goal must be to make that product more secure, more reliable, more robust. So you can't just sort of like spin off something and then sort of do a bad job at security because then you don't meet that, that qualification. So an open source steward is only an open source steward when they behave well and responsibly and when they basically sort of like do what the CRA wants them to do. Um, which uh, actually uh, at the ASF isn't actually that much of a problem because that's exactly why we're all together is to, be, to sort of like write the best software possible. So this isn't really sort of like a pain, but it's important to understand that all of these things sort of like, yeah, link together. Um, now, and then sort of like the CRA may sort of like actually become quite explicit in other areas where they sort of like start to explain that um, what it actually means is that you need to document things, you need to show how you are able to verify that uh, uh, you have a cybersecurity policy uh, that fosters the development of a secure product. So what they then sort of like go on saying is like, well, you have to have a cybersecurity policy, but it cannot say, oh, we don't do cybersecurity policy, we don't do security at all. Because you could have a policy which said, like, we don't do security at all, right? And you'd be happily ISO 27001 certified. As long as you d are not doing security, you're, yeah, you're doing what you're saying, so you're certified. No, they preempt that by saying, like, you have to have that policy, and that policy has to foster development of a secure product. So basically, that really sort of, like, has to be in the aim. And you sort of, like, have to show that uh, um, that's verifiable and documented. So your board, there's oversight of that. You can really show that you're doing it, and you know that you're doing it, and where you're not doing it. At some point, it escalates to, for example, a board, and they have means to make sure that you either do it or the product is removed from, from circulation. Um, and then also, basically, it says, like, well, and you should also have an effective handling of vulnerabilities, uh, um, uh, sort of like in place. And all of those things are quite reasonable if you read the whole CRA, because they're all risk-based. So if it's something major, act fast. If it's something minor, well, actually, you may never ask. So it's actually quite a reasonable sort of like balance. If you go through the whole CRA, um, you'll find actually that actually most of these things we're actually already doing, they're like our CVE processes, it's the triage we do when we get uh, bugs in security and we sort of like see is the series not so serious and then we sort of like act on it that way. It's a responsible re disclosure we're generally doing, um, it's basically things like release notes we're doing, it's the fact that we have peer review and, and, and plus ones whenever we do a release. So a lot of those things are already in place. There are also a couple of new ones. There are S-bombs. Uh, so basically secure bills of materials, because one of the things really re required is that at, at the end of the line, uh, whenever a consumer has a product, it's got to have a list of ingredients, exactly what's in that product, um, so that the consumer can basically verify whether actually it's secure and safe, and actually can go after the manufacturer and tell them like, hey, you're not, you're not shipping me what you should be shipping me. Um, but actually in the ASF, uh, we're actually, actually already quite far with S-bombs, and I expect that sort of like to only uh, increase. It will require a massive amount of tooling. Um, and the other thing which we'll have to do, which is new, is that we actually have to explicitly report to the regulators. Right now we do that informally, based on informal industry sort of things, but actually sort of like becomes an explicit thing. Now the devil is in the details. A lot of these things will be in standards, um, about 43 of them for our area, uh, over 150 extra ones for the rest of the industry. Um, we don't know exactly what will be in them when they're finalized. Uh, we are a bit, a little bit of a distance uh, from the processes and the places where these things are being written, so that's all a little bit painful. Um, we are actually expecting that the, co the, the, the international standards community will uh, struggle writing that many standards in such a short time, because most of the people in that community, are uh, their background is not IT but ICT, they're more in the land of telcos and wires and, and fibers and, and that sort of world. So software is quite alien for them. Um, and we're finding basically that despite all the assurances that, that when we knock on their door and we knock very loudly and very repeatedly, we're sort of like really sort of like not, yeah, not part of that process. And, and since yeah, we as open source community sort of like do about 90% of the world's software, uh, that is a little bit of an issue. So as a backup, um, we're basically doing an effort with our peers, with all the other open source foundation. So think, for example, like, I don't know, the, the Python Foundation, the Rust Foundation, and so on, um, at the Eclipse Foundation, to actually simply document what we are to do doing today. Because we know full well that effectively our normal Apache Software Foundation processes around security and stability are basically industry best practice. Uh, if you sort of like look, let's say, at industry in Europe, 
only a few percent of the companies in Europe is actually at that level. Only about 3% of the AIT companies in Europe has done a pen test, at least one pen test in the last three years. Um, most companies in Europe have never heard, heard of OWASP. So, I mean, th there's basically quite a bit of things. So basically, essentially we're expecting that once we've documented what we as Open Source Foundation do on security, we're sort of like there. Meanwhile, if you're really interested, there is a report which is sort of like I, I put on there and which will be on the, on the main list as well, which basically sort of like has a massive tables of what standards exist and what they already covered. And what you'll see there is that standards like, for example, OWASP already cover a lot of the, yeah, the good things we need to do. All right, so now a little bit sort of like more about the practical impact. Um, I'll give you first the bad news, although some of you will actually probably sort of like go, oh, that's great news, but I'll, I'll, I'll call it bad news anyway. Uh, and that's the impact on us, not on us as the ASF, but basically on all of us here as the industry, as, as employees or owners or whatever else of, of small and big uh, uh, IT companies. Um, basically, uh, we are sort of like now, um, yeah, we basically have to up the levels of uh, our security practices and policies in our companies to roughly the level of what we have at the ASF today. So essentially, the entire industry has to go to basically industry sort of like best practice levels, uh, which is uh, yeah a tall order for a lot of uh, companies and people. Companies will also basically not only have to do that, they will also have to have proof of that. And this is not proof in the ISO 27001 sense of the world that you basically have paperwork to cover your ass. No, the proof is actually in that it's functional and that you can show that it's functioning and that there are feedback loops to management and that your management actually understands what it's signing off on. And there are no ifs and buts. They can't sort of like delegate responsibility down the organization. It's the very top of the organization who basically sort of like has to determine that yes, it is acceptable to release something with a big vulnerability into it. Uh, and yes, I understand what the implications are. I have considered the end users. Here's the proof that I've considered the end users and the impact on society, and I've signed off. So that is quite a, uh, yeah, a tall order there. Uh, it means mandatory risk assessments uh, um, through the whole product life, life cycle. It means things like free security updates. It means all sorts of things around formal uh, 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 vulnerability and, uh, management. So uh, gone are the days that you can't contact the vendor about the security hole. I mean, that will get a hell of a lot easier uh, in the very uh, uh, near future. And then there's another much more painful part as if you happen to be writing uh, password managers, uh, software for chip cards, uh, for firewalls, uh, for public key infrastructures, yeah, then you're in, in a whole new world of pain. You're in the same world of pain as medical devices, as aviation, as military things and so on. You will have to get third party certification. Um, and that really sort of like, yeah, that is painful. However, if you're an open source steward and you're making sort of like the building blocks for that, you luckily do not sort of like have to do this. Uh, but the devil is in the details and, and yeah, exactly how this is going to play out isn't, isn't quite uh, clear. And yes, all of this will cost a lot of money. And fundamental in the PLD is that saying it's too expensive is not an argument. If it's too expensive, you have to take your product off the market. So uh, basically, yes, this will cost a lot of money. Uh, on the other hand, uh, by and large, most mature industries have sort of like profit margins sort of like in the, yeah, barely in the double digit percentages in the IT world, like 70% is, is pretty common. So, I mean, the money, money is there. It just will basically be spent differently. It will be spent on, on good engineering. So now sort of like the, the good news and sort of like the impact on us as the ASF and sort of like our, our uh, yeah, basically wider community. So all of a sudden, um, everyone here finds himself in a, in a slightly new world where actually doing the right thing, writing decent software, writing decent tests, uh, uh, doing decent maintenance, uh, um, uh, yeah, basically is now the law. And expect that rules, like ground rules, like 30% on maintenance, 30% on bug fixes and these sort of things and 30% on features, that those sort of ratio that's basically what those standards are roughly going to end up at, at being. Um, and that's no matter what your sales manager, your product manager, or anyone in management says, that is basically now the laws and the rules. And a bit unfortunate, regulators are not going to be very involved in some of this. It's actually your product liability insurance which will actually enforce this. So don't go like, oh, no government will ever enforce it, it will kill the industry. No, it's actually the insurance industry and all our stuff, like, and your finance industry, which killed this, and ultimately they have the money, so they, they rule. Um, 
for us, sort of like as, 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 yeah, the impact on us, basically, well, the direct impact on us is actually is really, really not too bad. What we'll actually end up doing is that we'll have to formalize a lot of the good things we're doing. For example, we've never written down that we're doing risk-based triage in the ASF. We've never written down that security actually looks at, like Arnold, I don't know where he's sitting, actually looks at the, at the reports and actually goes like, oh, this looks serious, and then actually acts very quickly, or he goes like, oh, whatever, and then basically he puts it on. on. He, he tells the PMC, but he, he doesn't sort of like hunt them every six hours, like, what's happening, right? So. We've actually never written that properly down. So we will have to write that down, and actually that will make us better. But we also probably have to write a lot of tooling uh, to automate the boring bits away. Uh, and if you look, for example, at S-bombs, if you look, for example, what's happening around airflow, we really are making a, a good start of that. So actually, I think a lot of that will actually probably end up on us having a lot more automation and, and us engineers being able to focus on the things which are actually much more fun rather than sort of like all the boring bits and much better dependency management, much better updating and all these sorts of other things. <coughs> Indirectly, there will also be a change, because I'm fully expecting this is, this is a problem for the entire industry. And if you're a small 10-people company, this is difficult stuff. So what are you going to do? Well, you're probably going to do exactly what you've done all through open source. You kind of, like, kind of look at your competitors, you've got the same problem, right? And you're probably going to collaborate. And probably, because a lot of this is engineering, it probably sort of like falls on us here in this room to actually do this for our company. So I'm fully expecting that next to doing code, we'll see similar sort of like, yeah, basically say, uh, security engineering practices and, and activities happening in our world as well, where, where certain projects do their things sort of like uh, collectively within those companies. And probably will be quite segmented because the rules are basically, things are, the, the, the trade-offs you're making, the engineering trades are making are very industry specific, very project specific, so there probably won't be something across uh, the whole world there. But sort of like the most important thing to remember here is sort of like that, 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 yeah, essentially society sort of like now has your back, sort of like if you want to do the right things in your company, um, uh, we as the ASF for the public goods, we are basically obligated to do that anyway, so not really a change, but it does sort of like prop us up here. And, and generally sort of like a lot of that will make it even more attractive to use open source um, and more attractive to use uh, the, 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 yeah, the, the frameworks and the foundations we have and the easy updating and the package managers and so on. Because essentially, that means you can sort of like automate a lot of these things sort of like away. So basically, sort of like to summarize, um, first of all, regulation is real. It's we're past every practical point in that that it could have been stopped in political ways or whatever else. There's complete agreement among all the politicians, whether they're left or right, uh, communist, socialist, liberal, democrat, it doesn't matter. Uh, basically, all in every house where we saw the votes going, uh, it basically passed sort of like uh, 99 to 100 or something like that, it was just abstentions and, and virtually no one voting against it. So this is basically uh, the case. Europe is a little bit ahead, US and the rest of the world is following, but yeah, just this is there. Generally, they've learned from the GDPR and other rules. Um, uh, there are basically no real loopholes. It's really about the outcome. Um, and it's really understood that it will make the industry more expensive. Um, and it really means there will be sort of like roadkill and that's totally calculated in, in the overall business case. So basically, yeah, that's just the way it is. Um, the, the massive changes will be in, in the industry, so they will be downstream from the ASF. It will be with the people who use our software. They have to do a lot of work, but of course that echoes back to us because it's easier to do a lot of things where basically collaboratively if you're not competing on that very thing. On our side, so no real change for us. It simply means we have to become more mature, step up our governments, step up our processes, formalize what we have, automate the hell out of it. So basically it means becoming essentially better at what we do and, and basically, uh, yeah, yeah, engineer the hell out of it, which is, which is probably also like in part like a, a fun thing. And finally, sort of like for the next two years, um, and this is also a little bit of a call to action, um, we will need a lot of help here in the foundation. Help means explaining sort of like basically what, what basically bringing back from your companies where the problems are, um, working on solving them, helping sort of like write, uh, uh, yeah, basically document what we're doing, help evangelize that, help basically uh, going to this effort with Eclipse and, and, and Rust and, and Python and so on to actually sort of like yeah, write down the consensus there, um, develop things like S-bombs, develop all sorts of other variations for different languages where, where we can basically do automated dependency management. So basically there are sort of like a lot of things which, which sort of like need to be yeah, practically done. But we have sort of like two, three years for that. So probably for the ASF, we're actually perfectly fine. Um, in your own companies, it, it, it'll probably be a little bit more of a, of a struggle. So thank you very much.